right. uh, welcome back everybody to San Francisco Dharma Collective. I'm MC Owens, <clears throat> and this is uh, one of my visual presentations on something Buddhist. And so today I'm, or this evening, tonight, wherever you are, I'm following up on a presentation I gave about a year ago, uh, at the end of January, 2020. I gave a presentation at the San Francisco Dharma Collective on, in San Francisco uh, on Buddhist cosmology. And it was a general introduction to sort of the, the general Buddhist worldview. And there's gonna be a lot of um, uh, a repeat of some of those ideas but it's necessary to tonight's topic, which is sort of an exploration of Mahayana Buddhist cosmology. And as you may know, there are these sort of two main kind of camps of Buddhism, sort of an earlier style, sometimes called the Abhidharma, uh, Hinayana, different terms. And that's more or less the worldview or the cosmology that I presented last time. Tonight is this kind of um, uh, some people call it a, a later development of Buddhism. I, I'm not quite sure about that, but it is this other type of Buddhism called Mahayana Buddhism that does indeed have a slightly different cosmology. And in, in some regards, it's, it's very different. I'll let you be the judge. Uh, I'm going to present a general introduction to this cosmology. And this is all... This is all heading towards what is called the inconceivable realm, the realm of the Buddhas and sort of the cosmology of the fully enlightened in a way. And that is in kind of indeed what Mahayana Buddhism is interested in is sort of the realm of the Buddhas or something like that. And so by the end of this, we will get to this inconceivable realm or at least the best I could do in presenting in PowerPoint form, the inconceivable realm. Uh, so that's kind of the arc for tonight. And um, a, th a theme that I would like to state at the beginning, because it's going to come up by the end, a theme for tonight is space and time. I know a lot of people are interested in time. I'm very interested in time. Um, and as moderns, right, we are sort of very aware of the intimate relationship between space and time. Indeed, there is even this idea of space-time as a singular concept. And so I want to plant that seed that tonight is definitely very much about space and time, and even maybe about space-time or something like that. So those are some themes going into tonight. <clears throat> So without any further ado, let's begin. So the first part, there's basically two, or I'd say there's three parts to this presentation. This is for the first part, in which it's a kind of basically a, a very quick repeat of the last presentation I gave on cosmology. But it's vitally important that we go through this again Otherwise, what is to come just will not make any sense. And so we need to talk about this general early Buddhist view of the cosmos or cosmology. In many ways, this cosmology, it's not too much different than general classical Indian cosmology regarding the world. And one word for this world that we find ourselves in <clears throat> is a loka datu. The word datu, this, the second part of this word, loka datu, datu, very difficult term to translate into English. Sometimes it's a dimension, sometimes it's a sphere. I'm going to go with realm for this evening. Loka, on the other hand, is an interesting word because we in English get the word local localized, locality, you go, it goes on and on, but the prefix for lok comes from the Sanskrit loka, 
And so indeed we are talking about localized realms, locodatus, and this is the general cosmology for a locodatu. It goes something like this. There is a period of creation, and this period of creation lasts 20 kalpas. And this is going to be the first, uh, the first connection being made between space and time. So a kalpa is a Sanskrit word. A, it, it's usually translated into English as an eon, an age, you know, and I'm not gonna go into lengths about how long a kalpa is. Indeed, I would be here for kalpas doing so, but I could summarize it with the general idea that a kalpa is the amount of time it takes for a mountain to erode. A very long, we're talking geologic, big, long time. And it takes 20 of these long epoch, age long periods. It takes 20 of these for the following to take place. There's this wind disk <laughs> called a Vayu Mandala. So this mandala or a disk, a kind of uh, circle. This is a circle or a mandala of wind or Vayu. Where this wind come from, comes from, don't worry about that just now. Just know that this begins with a wind. And upon, or I should say first before that, that this wind can be understood to be occurring in space. And this word akasha, it's a complicated word. In some instances, it, it actually means air. In some instances, it means like the sky up there. And then in more philosophical instances, akasha is the very uh, space in which things take place. <laughs> that th things need to take place somewhere and they, so they take place in space. And so this disc must be somewhere. And so we say it is in space. And indeed that space does have something to do with the cosmos in general. So just hold on to that idea. But this disc exists in space. And upon that wind disc, there emerges a water disc, a jala mandala. And upon that water disc, there emerges a golden crust of earth. And this golden crust of earth is called a Kanchana Mandala. And this golden crust of earth kind of crusts over, if you will, to form these kind of, uh, well, the beginning of land in that sense. And then from this land emerges these mountains at first one and then another, and you get this successive series of mountain ranges, seven in total, until finally a Mount Maru emerges from the middle. And this is a truly unique mountain among mountains, nay, I say king of mountains, because it is somewhat terrestrial in nature, but then kind of goes astral in nature and starts to get wider after an apex. So it's a kind of an interesting mountain in that sense. And I've put it here in my presentation as sort of blue because this mountain has four sides and the side that faces us here is lapis lazuli creating the sapphire blue sky that we see. And so there's an interesting relationship between the reflection of light off the surface of this cosmic mountain Maru and the blue sky. This, continue, this creation process continues with the creation of the sun itself, the moon, as well as the stars. And then this 
creation process begins to solidify with a, a ring of iron, sometimes a ring of iron and ice that surrounds the landmass. This is called the chakra vala, the ring of iron. And that holds in the waters seeping through that water ring underneath. And that creates the oceans and the seas. And uh, um, more or less what you're looking at now is sort of the world. The world as it is created has four massive lands, uh, continents as they might be called. The one that we are on, and I might, it might behoove me to say that this cosmology comes out of the subcontinent of India. And so there's a sense in which Jambudvipa is the triangular shaped subcontinent of India. Maybe it's all of Asia. It really depends on how this cosmology is interpreted. But you and I, we humans, as we are humans, are understood to live on the triangular shaped continent at the south side of Mount Meru called Jambudvipa. But there is a northern continent, a western continent, and an eastern continent. And again, if you want any deeper information about any of this, please refer to the original presentation I gave on the cosmology, which goes a little deeper into each of these sections. I'm kind of moving through this for, for time's sake tonight. This world here on the terrestrial realm, the earthly realms as they would be called, it's basically humans and animals is the general idea existing at this bandwidth here on the terrestrial realm. But that is in addition to some upper realms that are kind of at the upper levels of Mount Meru and beyond. And this is the realm of the devas, the gods and goddesses, and the realm of the asuras, the demigods. And we, as we will see, there are even lower realms below the terrestrial realm inhabited by hungry ghosts and hell dwellers, pretas and narakas. <clears throat> and those six realms together, the reason why I kind of relay this specific information to you tonight is those six paths of existence, a god, a demigod, a human, an animal, a preta, hungry ghost, or a naraka, hell dweller. Those are the six paths of rebirth or six paths of existence, but they are within something called the kamadatu, the realm of desire. And yes, the realm of desire, the realm of kama, it has a lot to do with the realm of sensual pleasure, the realm of sensual delights, and that which delights an animal is different than that which delights a human, which is different than that delights which delights a god. And so all six realms here exist in a realm of sensual pleasure or sensual delight, and even existing as a human or an animal or a hell dweller or a hungry ghost is an expression of one's karma or kama in that way. So this is that kind of kama datsu realm. And I'm going at length to kind of emphasize this realm of desire that is all the way down to the lowest hell realms to the highest of heavenly realms. Speaking of which, <clears throat> I want you to know that within the realm of desire, the same realm of desire in which the animals roam and the humans roam and the hell dwellers roam, there is also six levels of heavenly realms, but they do exist in the realm of desire. And so these are the six here, try to move everybody, sorry, here, but these six realms from the realm of the four great kings. These are actually four mountains at the periphery of our world here, our Lokadatu. And these four great kings actually create a force field that protects the earth from the radiation of the sun 
and cosmic rays, very interesting idea. Above the realm of the four great kings is the realm of Chakra Devanam Indra, the god of the sky, the stars. Also, the, that realm has 33 levels of heaven to it. And then that dividing line that I have in my presentation that separate the 33 Indra god heavens from Yama heaven, that actually represents the apex of Mount Meru, where we are we cease being in the terrestrial realm entirely, and we are now entirely in a spiritual psychic realm. And indeed, it is at that very tip where Yama, the king of the afterlife, the watcher, essentially weighs everyone's merit, their punya, positive and negative. And you either get to go up further into heaven or back down, and depending on how low, depends on your karma. Above the realm of Yama is the Toshita heaven of joy, and then a realm of delighting in creation, and then even in delighting in power over creation. And again, those heavenly realms all exist within this realm of desire. Just a little bit more about this realm of desire. Quickly, these are the 18 uh, hell realms or 16 hell realms. These are eight cold hells and eight hot hells all below the earth. These are the realms of the Narakas. And as you can see, they are quite uh, descriptive of the type of suffering that one undergoes in those realms. And I wouldn't leave you just with this world, with its hell realms and its terrestrial realms, there is, and this is more kind of, I'll know, not entirely, but this is kind of the heart of my last cosmological presentation, which was speaking about these higher realms of meditation. And eventually the role of the Dharma or the, the, the role of Buddhism in escaping from the samsaric cycle of rebirth in the realm of desire. That's sort of the, again, the heart of my pre last presentation, which is called Escape from Samsara. But this heavenly realm here, the first heavenly realm is the Brahma worlds, the realm of Brahma, who by the way, Brahma is the creator of this whole world that we're looking at in this way. And so he abides, Brahma abides in this upper realm. And what's interesting is, is that within the Buddhist tradition, the meditation practitioner who abides in the first dhyana abides in the Brahma Viharas, abides in the Brahma realms that are considered to be spatially above Mount Maru. Okay. Above the first jhana, oh, and actually before we continue, I want you to note that these Brahma worlds of the first jhana meditator, they exist in the realm of pure form, not the realm of kama, not the realm of desire. These are the realm of pure form. And so tonight, actually, let me pause here and say tonight, tonight's presentation on Mahayana cosmology is a very, very interesting look at life in the jhanas. And so for everyone who is familiar with jhana or dhyanic meditation and the idea of a first, second, third, and fourth jhana, tonight is an interesting presentation of the cosmology involved in being, or should I say, abiding in these various meditative states. In addition to the first jhana, there is the second jhana here, these realms of light, and there is a third jhana realm, these realms of beauty, limited beauty, limitless beauty, and total beauty. And then even above that is a fourth jhana realm, 
the Britrapala or the great reward realms. <clears throat> now, this is again, sort of the emphasis for tonight's presentation are actually these upper realms. I feel like last presentation sort of focused more on the lower realms. And so tonight we're focusing a little bit more on these upper realms. And so before I kind of go any further, I just, I should have said this at the beginning, but now that we have a, a real view of this here, all the way down to the hell realms, all the way up to the upper heavenly realms, you know, I, it, I didn't feel like I needed to say this at the beginning, but you know, this is about cosmology and there's a number of ways to understand this map. There's a number of ways to understand what you're looking at, and, and there's a number of ways to understand about uh, understand what you're about to hear. And I just would hope that everybody stays very open-minded to that and exploring possibilities about the, po the the poetics involved in all of this. Can I can I add something? Of course, please. Yeah, I was I was thinking about that um, while you were going through the the list of heavens, because when you were talking about, I, I went through the Vimalakirti Sutra after like months after you recorded it. And, um, you know, while you were going through the Viharas and all of that, it was sort of like a, almost like a guidance um, where I was like, okay, if I kind of stick with it and kind of see, um, you know, from that lens of whatever they describe in the Sutra and like, you know, with the heavens list as well, it's almost like I see the, the meditative absorption part of it um where it's like you see that okay since everything is doing itself if this is your abode so to speak then then this is what's going to happen <laughs> right it, excellent exactly <laughs> yeah yeah and so similarly thank thank you for that comment and so similarly i would invite you to look at this as an interesting map of those realms a, a new <laughs> map indeed thank you Right. So that's the period of creation that creates that world with all the hell realms, all the way up to the heavenly realms. And then we slip into a period of duration, an additional 20 kalpas in which heaven, in which beings, <clears throat> heavenly beings are descending into the earthly realm, earthly beings are ascending up to heavenly realms, Beings are going down to hellish realms, and there is a, just a massive cycling of psychic energy. <laughs> up and down and up and down, all around for 20 hall kalpas. Until we enter, <clears throat> well, that should have all been under the backdrop of that image. Until we enter a, a third period after the period of creation, after the period of duration, we enter a period of destruction also lasting 20 kalpas. And during this period of destruction, what happens is, is that an auspicious thing happens that seven suns appear in the sky and begin to scorch our world system. They scorch the hell realms, they scorch the terrestrial plane. In fact, they scorch Mount Meru, they even scorch the wind disk and space itself. Everything is gone. And in fact, this scorching goes all the way up and even those abiding in the first jhana, ah! they are gone. And all that remains after this great event of the seven suns appearing is that any being that has escaped to the realm of pure form and made it to the second jhana heaven, the realms of possessing splendor. They survive the scorching of the seven suns. And now this is actually where I return to the beginning of the talk where I mentioned that there's this disc, or I'm sorry, there's a period of nothingness, 20 kalpas. Then, there's this disc. So 20 kalpas of absolute still nothingness until the stirring of this disc of wind. And then a world. And then what they say is, is that actually beings 
that have been abiding in the third or second, third, and fourth jhanas begin to descend into this terrestrial realm that has been created and begin to fill it with hell realms by their karmic activities descending further down. And eventually the whole process begins over again. And there's a period of duration <laughs> that lasts 20 kalpas. <laughs> and so I figured while we're waiting <laughs> in the period of duration, I would tell you part two of the cosmological uh, map here. So this is what could be called Sahasra cosmology. And the word Sahasra is a Sanskrit word for a thousand. And here is, and, and this is an, a thing that you may have heard about or read about in sutras, but I wanna show you about it. So here we are, this is our Loka Datu. And we have all the hell realms and the terrestrial realms and the heavenly realms and even the realms of pure form. And if you're someone abiding in the second jhana or the third jhana or the fourth jhana, from those upper heavenly realms, the world can start to look a little small. And actually what it is, and this is the very interesting new information I have for you tonight, which is that actually the pure or the realms of pure form, in particular, the second and third and fourth jhanas, they have much broader areas than the terrestrial realm, hellish realms, and even the realm of the first jhana practitioner. From the second jhana and above, the area that is covered by those realms, the upper realms, well, it covers not just the area of one world system and not just the area of two or three or four or five or six or seven or eight or nine. In fact, the area covered by the second, third and fourth Gianna realms is equivalent to 1000 localized realms. And this is called a chula sahasara lokadatu, a small thousand localized realms. And so please don't bother counting. That is, of course, not a thousand. I have to tell you, in, in you know, I mentioned Brahma, the creator of the world who abides in the Brahma heavens. I don't know how Brahma did it because my computer crashed two times trying to put this presentation together. This got to be so much data that I, maybe he was cloud computing and Indra's net or something, I don't know, but the, it's, a, it's a lot of information shrinking down. But the idea is, is that these upper realms abide and encompass a thousand worlds. And this is really where I open it up to you to really wonder what is being spoken about here. I've said in Dharma talks in the past, maybe they're talking about the stars in the sky that you see. Maybe they're talking about the cosmos and what is beyond and, and you know, and Captain Kirk and, and Spock and going out and finding these places, maybe. The idea of a multiverse definitely comes to mind. An intersubjective universe comes to mind in terms well, of a meditation. Meditation. Please, what do you got? <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, I was just kind of dreaming up as, as we were going and I was thinking that um, in a sense, it's like uh, the Buddha field or Buddha land, right? Um, like I was just out on a walk and I noticed that, um, you know, I don't really, like the only thing I know in terms of storyline or how reality is shaped is based on how I, how I think about it, right? On a just day to day, and that kind of shapes how I feel about it as well. So I was like, okay, if I can, you know, if I look at it only from my perspective, so to speak, right? Only from here, and and 
if I look from a from one of these uh, localized realms, right? You could you could see how like even um, like SFDC is like a localized realm, right? Or YouTube is a localized realm, um, or you know, or and so so somebody <clears throat> perceiving from one of these realms is like seeing through that lens. And then you could be like, okay, well, if there's a multiverse, then this is the multiverse or the realm of, of anger and hatred and delusion. And this is the one with, with pure seeing and pure light. And so, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Again, and I'm not going to say, I'm, I'm just, it's great thinking. I, this really is wide open to possibilities. We, we have places, we have further places to go. Because you might remember, I was telling you, if you, especially if you saw the last cosmology talk, this, by the way, I was trying to find out this, and I couldn't find this information. So remember these seven suns up here, and they scorch a localized realm. But interestingly, the inhabitants of the second, third, and fourth jhana escape that because they are not in that realm that is scorched, right? But there is a sense in which these suns eventually, I don't know if they scorched the whole small world system at once, or if they scorch, they like cruise around like a comet scorching the whole thing. But eventually after seven scorchings of the localized realms, there is a, giant deluge a giant flood and that floods the entire something verse all the way up to the third jhana so those people that were in the second jhana they lasted through one appearance of the seven suns two appearances of the seven suns but after seven appearances of the seven suns there's this flood that floods everything up to that realm as well. And they get sucked back down into the nothingness that pervades for 20 kalpas. <laughs> Until there's this disc. <laughs> and upon this disc, there emerges a world and the hell realms are populated. Oh, and I meant to mention that the first jhana it seems to function like a gateway or a doorway that opens back up access to these realms that have been chilling aloof from the world system. The sort of discovery of the jhana or the first jhana in our realm seems to create access to that. It's another thing I'm looking into exactly how that works. But for those abiding, as we know, for those abiding in the upper dhyanas, the third and fourth dhyanas, it's not about one localized system. It's about a thousand localized systems, right? Ah, but that's where if you abide in the third or the fourth dhyana, the area of those heavenly realms is much wider. And so actually, even a small thousand world system begins to look pretty small from the upper heavenly realms. And actually, the third and fourth jhana, they have an area the size of a thousand thousand world systems. So this is what is called a Mejima Sahasra Lokadatu, a medium thousand world system, which again is a thousand collections of a thousand worlds. And those abiding in those upper realms have a vast, vast area in which they abide. And so I mentioned the seven suns that appear and I mentioned the flood that happens every seven suns. But after there have been seven floods, there is this great wind disc, a hurricane of some sort, a cosmic hurricane or a great wind as it's described. 
And that, which again, it occurs after seven destructions by water, which is, and 49 destructions by fire. And this wind eventually wipes out everything up to the fourth jhana. And in general, within Mahayana Buddhist cosmology, it is, it is advisable <laughs> to enter into the fourth jhana so that one avoids these catastrophes in that way. And if you go back and watch the last presentation I gave on uh, cosmology, I mentioned that there are there is an even deeper meditation realm, and those are the formless realms. They are considered beyond the geonic realms. They are considered beyond the realm of pure form in that way. Indeed, they are in the formless realm. And in this Dharma talk, I decided to actually try my best to, 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 to honor and respect that by not even attempting to put that realm in this PowerPoint presentation of form. Honestly, honestly, truly. So there is this idea of a formless realm that is beyond form. And so there's no idea of a Lokadatsu and a Mount Maru and a hell realm. That's all, that's all form. And so there is this idea of, of a, a formless realm. And in Buddhism, there are even four levels to that formless realm. And so everything I've sort of been talking about that pertains to this fourth jhana, it's sort of said to pertain to those formless realms as well, which is that if you happen to be abiding in a formless realm, you avoid the conflagration by fire, you avoid the deluge by the flood, and you avoid the giant wind. You avoid all of that. And I want you to know that Basically, at the time of the Buddha, it seems if, if, if we, you know, based on history and also just based on the Buddhist teachings, the idea is, is that at the time of the Buddha, there were many meditation traditions, many yoga traditions, and many of these yoga meditation traditions were about getting into these realms, in particular, the fourth jhana or above, so that you would be spared the conflagration and the flood and the wind. And as I spoke about um, in my last presentation, Escape from Samsara, the idea of, of the Dharma or Buddhism and the idea, well, what I stressed in that is that there is a view of reincarnation here, of course, I've stressed it regarding the hell realms and the upper realms and rebirth in those realms. But there is this idea of this churning of psychic energy that I mentioned, and a kind of one form of release was getting into these deep meditative states where you are not participating in this churning of psychic energy. But in that cosmology talk, I stressed that the, the the Dharma and the Buddhist practice is not about actually moving oneself out of this realm. It's actually having an entirely different relationship with this realm, actually entirely shifting one's disposition towards what's happening right here, right now. Nothing to do with heavenly realms or hell realms or anything else in that way. And so that was what I stressed last time. But the idea is, is that in Again, traditional Indian yoga meditation, even at the time of the Buddha, he studied these ways to get out here. And that basically out here, oh, there's a wind <laughs> and a world. <laughs> and that out from this realm, even these little localized realms and collections of localized realms start to appear pretty small until eventually the, the, the Mahayana Buddhist cosmology is that the practitioner in these upper realms 
actually has an area the size of a thousand collections of a thousand collections of a thousand worlds. And this collection of a thousand thousand worlds or a billion worlds is, is called a tri sahasra maha sahasra lokadatu. 3,000 great thousand localized realms. Sometimes this is translated as a trichiliocosm. I've seen billion fold world universe. I've seen, um, sadly, sadly, I have seen just cosmos. And I always get a little disappointed when I see the see this idea of a tri sahasra mahasahasra loka datu a three thousand great thousand world system. I'm always a little disappointed when they translate it as cosmos because I really don't think that quite captures what's being spoken about here. Because <laughs> indeed, a cosmos is contained within a loka datu, and so the the vastness of this, the scale of this. Is, is truly hard to capture, right? And so- One oh, more thing you say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I, um, I also noticed, you know, the same, the, the same walk that, you know, if, if you were to say perceive from such a realm, right? It's, um, mm -hmm. in a sense, it's like, as you look at your experience um, from such a place and say you look at, um, a leaf or a tree or the moon and it's recognizing that each of these you know say one of these these round things is the moon for example you could notice that even that just the moon itself what you see just that tiny blip in the sky is so rich of you know craters and mountains and you know who knows what kinds of beings are out there on that planet or <laughs> or on the moon and it's like uh you know you think of the moon at that scale and you can notice the same by just looking at your thumb uh in, in terms of um fullness or interdependency um yeah hold on <laughs> hold on thank you so this is the famous trichilicosm, my attempt at portraying a 3,000 great thousand world system. And well, let me say this, this is the basic idea of the, of the cosmology class from last time, which is that the Buddha in his great wisdom achieved these states that, me that many people before him achieved and many people after achieved, but he achieved these great states of um, abiding, let's say that, of vision to be able to see this. And by the way, too, uh, I should have mentioned this, but no time like the present. So those abiding in these upper heavenly realms, the second, then the third, and the fourth jhana, by virtue of abiding in those realms, have a vantage point on the periods of creation, duration, destruction, and nothingness of these world realms that they kind of abide over in that way. And so what I mean is, is that there is a relationship here between the abiding in upper heavenly realms, third, fourth, or second, third, and fourth jhanas, and the ability to sort of see through time, shall I say? What I'm getting at is, is that you may be familiar with the idea or the fact, depending on where you stand, that meditators, meditation practitioners at certain levels in, in many traditions, not just Buddhism, but upper level meditation practitioners obtain a certain knowledge or awareness or sight even 
of their past lives and not just their own past lives, but the past lives of others. And I would suggest that there's a relationship between having this vantage point over the creation, duration and destruction and nothingness and creation, duration, destruction and nothingness and that cycl cyclical nature of these world systems by abiding above them and seeing them be created and destroyed might have something to do with that ability to see past and future lives. Just wanted to mention that. But the Buddha in his great wisdom, in that great enlightenment is said, is said to have seen even the beings in the fourth jhana and the realms of nothingness over enough kalpas, after enough conflagrations, after enough floods, after enough winds, after enough time, they too eventually fall back down into the cycle of samsara. Is, that's the general idea. And so the dharma, the Buddhist path, is said to be beyond that is said to be outside of the whole game of rebirth and all of that. And I mean, for simplicity's sake, of course, the idea is, is that the whole reincarnation game is predicated on the idea of a self going through reincarnation. And so upon the realization of no self, the Dharma practitioner is instantly liberated from that cycle by awareness of there not being a self there. But this is not, not, it's, this is not that kind of Dharma talk. So hold off to the end if you still have a lingering question about that. But my point is, is that that approach, the Buddhist approach of just non-attachment and not clinging to self in a way, that approach is very interesting. And so this view, which is described often in sutras, the view of actually seeing a 3,000 great thousand world system. Well, the idea is, is that a Buddha, and let's, let's just for simplicity's sake tonight, I'm just going to be talking about a Buddha or the, the Buddha, there's debate about whether bodhisattvas are involved in this or not. That's sort of neither here nor there. But the idea is, is that life as a Buddha is a little different. And it's not only that the Buddha has this vantage point of scale that we've been describing, that somehow when you get in these upper realms, you sort of start to have this vantage point. Well, Indeed, from the perspective of a Buddha, even a 3,000 great thousand world system begins to look pretty small. And so what they say of a Buddha in the Buddhist tradition is that a Buddha is able to take a 3,000 great thousand world system and place it on the tip of a hair. Now, that's pretty much um, the point of my whole presentation tonight, was to actually place 3,000, a billion world systems on the tip of a hair and show it to you. That was like my Vimalakirti trick of the night, is that if, if I could do that, that would be pretty, yay! <laughs> but... I didn't actually put you through all of that for nothing. So this is the inconceivable realm. The inconceivable realm is where a 3,000 great thousand world system fits squarely on the tip of a hair. And, and, and that of course, it, it should right away seem, you know, absolute sci-fi craziness, wildness, it should actually, if it, if it seems too normal, then it's not, you know, we need to do better then because it really is supposed to be a very wild idea. And in particular, actually in particular, I need to remind you of this because you've probably heard this. The Buddha is able to take not just 
a 3000 great thousand world system and put it on the tip of a hair. But they always say with all of its Mount Meru's and its Nagas and Devas and Yakshas and Nagas and, ya and all of its human beings and all of its oceans and everything. And not just, of course, the one world, but all of the Mount Meru's and all of them and put them squarely on the tip of a hair without any of the inhabitants in those worlds knowing anything has happened, right? And so I needed to walk you through the actual cosmology of Alokadatu so that you could appreciate that this is not just a little squiggle on a hair tip. It is actually three, <laughs> three a billion world systems and what that entails, right? But now let's talk a little bit more about the inconceivable realm. I wouldn't do that to you. I wouldn't leave you in just the sci-fi land. So what's interesting about this talk tonight is I, I have a very funny uh, path. My, my path that has led me here tonight is a very funny path. And, you know, talk about karma and talk about um, life, you know, but it's so funny that, I, and I look back on it and it's like all through like high school, it happened like twice in high school and then a couple of times in college, I wound up taking like, um, uh, I took in high school, a public address class, like basically a class on giving speeches. Like why I did this, I don't know. I think it was because I thought it would be an easy A, like, oh, you just get up and talk. Like, I don't have to read anything. Like that's I just have to have the nerve to get up to do that. Like I could do that. Um, and so I mentioned this because in one of the early uh, classes, and this was actually probably like my freshman or or second year of college, and I took a another weird class in like persuasive speech or something, like just these really weird classes that I look, again, I look back, I'm like, why did I take these things? But in one of those classes, I gave my first like big talk. Um, and it really, it's a funny talk because I really think it shaped me in a lot of ways. And it was a talk on the difference between linear and cyclical time. I was like, you know, such a nerd and I was like so into science and all this different stuff, but I was also beginning my study of Taoism and Buddhism and it was really interested in, you know, Eastern philosophy as it would be called and just other ways of thinking and all of that. And I had really had, you know, my own sort of at, at least, you know, freshman year of college insights about time and about like, linear time versus cyclical time and what that kind of meant and all of that. And so it's interesting. And I, you know, I don't know how that talk went over. Um, like if, if, you know, I probably was able to share my enthusiasm about time. <laughs> I, I don't know if anybody walked away with clarity about the difference between the two. But the reason why I mentioned that is, is I actually want to end, end this presentation tonight by bringing it back to round to the topic I stated at the opener, which is this space-time idea. And I'm going to revisit my old talk. I'm going to revisit my old talk. And we're going to have a conversation about linear time versus cyclical time. And so what I have here is, is in the, and yes, this is the, um, the loca dot two that would be familiar to the person of classical India, right? Um, but of course, I want you to know, or you should know, that the Greeks, and in the, early were, in, the, in the early days of the Greek civilization, they were getting a lot of ideas from India. And indeed, for a while, the Greeks had what we would call a flat earth kind of a model that didn't look too much different than this in terms of Olympus and all of this. So there's a lot of correlations between these things. And so, rather than recreating a Western model of the world, I'm just gonna stick with my Lokadatu here, for example. But the important part about this is what's at the top of this. So what I've put at the top is that our general conception 
of time. And if anybody in the audience is like, that's not my conception of time, respect. For, for real, if, especially if, if you're somebody that's like, that's not my calendar, that's not my time, respect. However, in so far as you or I or anyone understands themselves as living in the year 2020, you're pretty squarely in a linear time system because I hate to tell you, but that number system works uh, zero to 2020 and 2021 and beyond. It's the very way that that works. And I'm joking a little bit, but I just want you to think about this. And so, I, I, and I mean this seriously, if, if you don't see time this way, respect for real. So I'm not, I don't want to presume you think this way, but I do want to walk through what it means to think this way. And what it means to think this way is that there was a moment of creation. Maybe you call it a big bang. Maybe you call it Genesis. Maybe you call it, I don't know what, but there's a notion that there was a creation event that started this project <laughs> and we are now oh and of course we have a weird time system that moves to the year zero but then moves forward you know it's a little weird but it doesn't matter because the conceptually there's the notion of creation the notion that it's 2021 and we're headed towards destruction and again whether you think that's the supernova of the sun and the uh, when the earth is brought into the the radius of the sun or whether you think it's the big crunch when all the matter of the universe is brought back to the singularity or whether I, you know the uh, plerima of christianity when all is with god again I, you know there's so many different ways to cut this but the idea is is that if you think of it as a moment of creation and now here I am, and it's all headed towards an, the end, and that's the end. <laughs> that's what we would call linear time. That would, that, that would be linear time, that there's just one creation event, a duration of time, and an end of time. All right, and again, this is not about like, whether you should see it this way or not. I'm just kind of laying out the groundwork for that idea. This would be in distinction to this model, where you have the Indian view that I've laid out with the Lokadatu cosmology, that there is this Lokadatu that goes through periods of creation, duration, destruction, nothingness, and then creation again, duration, nothingness. And it just keeps going around and around and around and around and around. And the idea of this, of course, where somebody could get such a crazy idea that it just keeps going around and around and around is from the seasons, is from the moon, the waxing and the waning, is from the cyclicality of everything else around us. <laughs> Everything else around us moves in cycles. Why wouldn't the creation, destruction, and creation, the destruction of the earth, or the cosmos or the universe as well? And so that's where you move into the general, kind of general Indian, general Buddhist, kind of, mm, you know, it's a lot of other cultures that have this view of time, that, it, that we we find ourselves in a season of the world. Michael, I have a question yes. that, or maybe you, you can share some thoughts. You know, thinking about time, um, I'm thinking about um, time only exists when there is experience and, or it seems like when there is experience and time only exists when there is thought. So, <laughs> thought is and and experience is always limited it has always a beginning and an end and i feel for me and like experience and thoughts are prior to time mm -hmm. 
Um, but if we go one step even further back then and thinking about, you know, who is experiencing, who has the experience and who has the thought comes from a non-local, um, let's say entity, you know, so <clears throat> we would in Buddhism, we would probably call it emptiness or um, so I don't know, some thoughts around around the root cause of time space yeah anyway some thoughts just yeah 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 uh, as usual connie you're one step ahead of me you're one slide i'm one slide behind you so let me um and and by the way i i fortunately managed to to have an extra some little extra time here and so there will be i only have a little bit more to say so we'll have lots of time for discussion but connie's um insight regarding or question slash insight regarding the origin of time is an interesting one and so while i have been talking about time quite cyclically throughout this uh talk it's, I said at the beginning, this was all to actually arc towards an, this understanding of what the Buddhist or Mahayana Buddhists call the inconceivable realm. And so we need to go back to the 3000 great thousand world system on the tip of a hair. And so what about time here? Is this linear? Is this cyclical? Like what is exact when when you're abiding in some Buddha realm or some fourth heavenly dhyana realm and you are actually witnessing the cyclical creation, duration, destruction, nothingness, creation, duration, and you're witnessing this of, of worlds, that's some other time then. That cannot be cyclical time anymore. And so indeed, as Connie foreshadowed here, there is, I will suggest, a, a third way of thinking of time. And it is a very Mahayana Buddhist way of thinking of time. And it is this, that indeed, as Connie was saying, the, I, the past and the future and even the present in this model extend out from extend out. And I dare even say that they extend out from the present moment because I would, and I am suggesting by my chart here that even the idea of calling this the present is exactly part of this explosion of time that happens all at once in this realm of the Buddhas, in this inconceivable realm. And this is sort of the main kind of idea that I wanted, was hoping actually that I would get to tonight, which is what does it mean? What is, or what is one thing that it could mean to put a billion fold world universe on the tip of a hair? Well, I think it would certainly place one outside of normal conventions of time. Absolutely. But if we aren't gonna, if, if for the moment, if, if for the moment we don't take all of this literally, quite so literally of putting a billion world universe on the tip of a hair, let's take one poetic step back and just try to imagine what could be, like what could be being suggested with this image of placing a billion fold world universe on the tip of a hair. And what I'm suggesting is, is that it's a very beautiful image, right? A whole billion worlds on the tip of one hair, that it's a beautiful image to capture this Mahayana idea of time emerging out of, again, I dare, I don't want to call it the present, but it's emerging out of experience in that way. And and what that means is that it's not like linear time where the past came before the present, which leads to the future. It's sort of all at once in that way. 
Yes, and, this. Oh, I'm sorry. I I just yeah. I just got really excited when this That's slide. Great. <laughs> really excited because this is the only view of time that makes sense to me, and I still don't really know how it makes sense. But when I think of of now, of present time awareness, now it's now, it's now, it's now, it's always now, it's always now, and in the, in now, it, to me, the past and the future seem they seem not real. They seem, they seem like certainly they're, I guess, ideas that I could entertain, but they don't seem to have any real hook to them. And yet now is a process. I mean, it's, it's now for us, then it's now again, then it's now again. And yeah, past and future seem almost, they seem fictional. And where, whereas the now seems like it could go ever deeper and ever deeper and ever deeper, not like it stops though. It, it's, it's not a stopping spot. It's something that not only goes outwards, but also goes inward. I, it's this, it's this thing, it's this thing that you're showing. <laughs> yeah, that, that's all I have to say about that. So I'm just very excited by this slide. Thank you. Excellent, Suzanne, I'm so excited. And indeed, Connie, Suzanne, I mean, everybody's right on top of it. So next slide, the real kind of also origin of this is this self, which is the hair, and the other, which is the billionful world system. And the idea here is, is that not only does time come into existence, or, or it's a confluence of self, other, past, present, future, all at once. That is the, the kind of the Can inconceivable I, realization. <laughs> What's that? Can I just push it one step further? Do it. Yeah, so you've got that other, you've got the self, and now you're like, okay, am I the self that's the hair? Is the water droplet on my hair the other, which is the million-fold world? Or am I the self that's noticing the inconceivability of time mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it you know ex what you just said is exactly why i did this presentation the way i did with these kind of mo perspective moving away moving away moving away i wasn't trying to hypnotize anybody i was just trying to educate in that way but moving away to then in a way, leave it right with that question that, or that insight that you just had about that idea of who's, who's, who's in the inconceivable then? Yes, exactly. So thank you for that. Excellent. And other, again, I'm, I've pretty much said my said. Anybody thoughts, ideas, comments about this? I'm glad to see everybody so excited about this, um, these slides. It was kind of a... Michael, how do you think about um, the idea when we talk about this, whatever, three billion million words, words, um, what do you think about um, perception comes to my mind in the sense of like, you know, in every moment we just perceive 5% of the so-called reality, right? And everything else we planned out and we just perceive this 5% based of our conditioning. So when I think about these worlds, I could also like the notion of perception comes, you know, I can perceive a moment in 3 billion ways, this very moment. So anyway, just perception. Coming from my mind. Yeah. Um, just yeah. coming from a different perspective of Understood. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, totally. And yeah, you know, I, I don't want, I didn't, I didn't want to say too much, you know, about like what I think these 3000, I mean, I've said enough, I think about what I think the hair tip metaphor means, but I will, I, I did want to say, and, and I want to make it really clear that when I say this, when I suggest this, I no way saying I think this is it. This is like one more to add to the mix of possibilities to get our minds thinking that that's all, that's all. But I do think there is one way to think about what it means for a meditator who abides in, let's just go with the second jhana. They abide in the second jhana and the area of that encompasses, if you will, a thousand worlds. 
all right? I've done a lot of, I, you know, I spent a lot of time with this PowerPoint presentation with all the crashes and everything. So I've been doing these slides a lot lately. And I've had a lot of time to think about what it might mean. And so one idea that, that came to mind was I do have a feeling that there's a way of thinking about these loca.2s. In particular, this idea of the comma dot two within the loca dot two sort of idea, this realm of desire in which beings are born as hell dwellers or hungry ghosts or humans or animals or what have you. I think there's a way of looking at that, uh, especially from a Mahayana point of view, there's a way of looking at that localized realm as the subjective universe. And so this way that everybody's really wrapped up in their own subjective universe, but the meditator who abides in this higher realm, I feel like my feeling about it is that they could, I, I mean, I'm kind of just like riffing here, but it's like they could really understand the perspectives of about a thousand people. They are above the zeitgeist of about a thousand people and they abide in this realm of pure form that is about the ideas that these thousand people are engaged in, but they have no attached desire to those ideas. And so they are able to have more objectivity. So it speaks about being like a really, really myopically, karmically subjective. And then these other meditation realms are when is someone is a little, you're a little more objective about what's going on. And then even more objective to where it's a billion worlds that it's like you would have an objective stance on a billion subjective opinions in that way. Does that make sense as a, again, just as a possibility, not as the way? Hey, Michael. Hi. Uh, I'm thinking hey. about, uh, hi. <laughs> I'm thinking a lot about the Avatar Saka Sutra uh, through this talk, where there seems to be a couple twists uh, on top of that. One, one seems to be like the identification of the Buddha body with the universe itself uh, that happens there, and where the, this observer uh, subject object seems to kind of uh, melt a little bit in that sense through that. Mm -hmm. um, the other one that you didn't mention is like this, this this explosion of like worlds into worlds, but there's also this notion of like every atom of each world contains billion worlds and so on, this recursive step as well, which is another kind of a, uh... <laughs> Absolutely. And I do, by the way, uh, Jean-Francois, you mentioned the Avatamsaka Sutra. That is part three of this cosmology okay. presentation that I will give at some point, maybe in uh, uh, you know soon. But the Avatamsaka Sutra takes this even further with what they call the flower bank repository world. And that gets beautiful. And the Avatamsaka Sutra is, yes, very much about the idea that one of these billion fold world universes is inside each atom of every billion fold world universe. And that is where the Avatamsaka cosmology goes kind of holographic, where any particular element contains all the other elements. And indeed, that's where it goes wild. <laughs> it, indeed, and so wild that it requires an entirely other uh, presentation. So this was priming us, getting us ready for that one. So thanks. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Are there comments or insights about any of that? I'm I'm thinking it'll require a, a different program than PowerPoint if this one if this one crashed. <laughs> yeah, I would not be able to squeeze them. I don't know how many more trichiliocosms you can. Great. Um, something you said when you were talking about the, the, the first cycle of destruction, the one that, that, the, that the, only the uh, first jhana gets sucked into, but the second, third, and fourth remain. And then when you said when the world gets rebuilt, re rebuilt, I, I, I don't know if you meant to say this, but I thought it was beautiful that you said that the, then when the, pe the, the beings in the second, third, and fourth 
jhana realms, uh, they 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 repopulate the world, but you I think you use the word create. So they create the realms, and I thought that was so. Hmm. Uh, I don't I don't know if it's if it's if it's truly what the cosmology says, but it evokes that idea that you know we're we create all of this. You know, we create a hell realm by being hungry ghosts. You know, and we create whatever realm we're in, beings create, beings create realms rather than populate them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That might have been a slip of, of my tongue, but a good one in that way. And by the way, Noam, you reminded me of something. It was sort of, now that we're sort of like in interpretation hour in that way, <laughs> where we can kind of, um, you know, there is a like, okay, so what are these localized realms, these Lokadatus and Mount Meru and the hell realms? Like, so what's going on with that, right? And I think there's an interesting, um, it's almost a cosmology unto itself in a way, but there's an interesting way of looking at that um, where, well, in essence, the Lokadatsu is a, um, a macrocosm, if you will, of the microcosm of the body. And there's this thing where, you know, and this might, I, I don't know, it actually might, it might say something about the Buddha realms, but what I was <laughs> going to say, sorry, I lost my train of thought, but what I was going to say is, is that there's this way of looking at the Lokadatsu as the macrocosm of the body, where we do sort of, because we are homo sapiens, there's a way that our idea of heaven and cognition and joy is up here. And our idea of, of hell is down there. And it's an interesting thing about the, the looking at this as the cosmology of the body in a kind of psychic way where again we sort of i mean if you're into the idea of like lower chakra stuff upper chakra stuff if you're into that idea in terms of kundalini yoga and seeing root chakra stuff being more primordial very very emotional and as you move up the chakras you get more and more intellectual more creative until you're at the spiritual chakra well lo and behold that looks a lot like a lokadatu and so there's a way of looking at hell realms and all of that as kind of ener energetic forces. And this idea that there's this kind of entropic energetic pull towards certain things that wind you up as a hungry ghost or in the hell realm. And then there's other forces that sort of propel you up Mount Maru in that way. So just an interesting additional way of looking at the cosmology of the just the Lokadatu itself, where it's like, oh, maybe that's why Mount Maru is like that. And it's like, oh, maybe that makes a lot more sense than uh, Polaris, the Polaris mountain that, you know, we should all get the uh, expedition together to go find the magical mountain at the center of the world, right? I'm all for going to or an archaeological exposition to find this giant mountain in the center of the world, but they might be talking about something else. I like this what you're saying here about the about this the like the really root physical, like the root chakra, all the way up to the kind of the more cerebral. And I wanted to know if you could say more about actual genre practice, which is something that I've been attempting for the last couple of years to. I don't know, greater or lesser success, at least is, at least it feels like I've heard it described and and how it kind of correlates to to this cosmology. I just the actual practice itself, you know, like from going from the, you know, the body ecstasy to, you know, the more of the emotional joy to the tranquility to the equanimity. And I realize there's ones after that that I don't know that I could ever touch. But um, yeah, about that. Mm-hmm. Well, hmm. Well, I'll tell you, I, I mean, that's a big, that's a big question. I'll try to find the, the nice way to answer it in that way. Um, 
so it's interesting in this presentation one very interesting thing is that first jhana where you're sort of outside the realm of desire right you're outside of the kamadatu and remember the kamadatu is the hell realms hungry ghost realms it's all that it's all the every all that stuff the dhyanas or jhanas they, they this is really really important it's a really really important distinction that i'm not sure you know everybody makes this distinction enough jhanas take place in this realm of pure form they do not take place in the realm of desire and that's a very, very hard thing to, to like talk about and explain and all of that. As it pertains to tonight's presentation, I would suggest that you think of this. And I'm, I'm going to have something better to say in a moment, Suzanne, but I want to say this. As it pertains or relates to tonight's presentation, the whole idea is if you are in a geonic state, you are not human because that is a form of kama and exists in the kama datu. And so the reason why jhanas are, are pleasurable and the idea of them is that you actually transcend. And this is where it gets complicated because I don't, it's not like, I don't want to make it sound too weird that you transcend your human state. It's not about that. It's about what we have talked about, you know, Suzanne, I know you've been coming to my classes forever, so we've talked about it a lot, but it's about recognizing that so much of, of like, like this, right, is relative, relative to my, my I often say hey, my, my, me being a husband is relative to my wife, so I'm not actually that that's actually the realm of desire the realm of of comma in that way and actually once you start going through i'm only human relative to the animal realm it's why human realm and animal realm are part of the kamadatu is because human is relative to animal which is relative to all the others and so when one is abiding in the realm of pure form one has actually transcended those distinctions of I'm a male husband within this and that, and I'm a human. You're abiding in this feeling that has no uh, sex or gender or species to it. It's like, and in fact, if you if you paid attention to the presentation, it has limited locality. Yeah, it's personless. It's very personless is how it feels. Excellent. And so that I think is the best I can give you as an answer, Suzanne, is that it's, and it's not about seeking that, it's about recognizing actually what is pulling us down into the realm of kama. And I don't say this in a bad way, like, ooh, the realm of kama is all over me. It's not about that. It's about recognizing what gets me down here. And then, oh, so if I'm not in, I'm not entertaining those ideas of my humanity right now, or my social status, or my, what, my money status, I'm out of that. Those are jhanas. And the idea is that that first jhana is, is a, what would we say, tenuous. And that idea that you, it, it's really still related to this world, which is, I believe, in a sense, why maybe when the seven suns appear, you get burned up too. But when you make it to that second jhana, something has changed to where you're not as connected karmically to this kamadatsu in that way. Yeah, it's a huge shift. It's because like that whole, that beginning first, you know, state or whatever, I don't really know what to call it. It's something that I, I can't even really bear for very long. It's just too, it becomes too buzzy and too, and then it, when it drops away, it's like, okay, then I feel, I don't, it doesn't feel like me anymore. It's weird. But I and I like it. It's a, it's something that I just am very interested in. So thank you. That was a really helpful explanation. Oh good. Thanks for the question. I'm actually I spent so much time talking about Jana or Diana. I really thank you for 
uh, calling me out on, hey, can you bring this back to the actual practice for a minute? So thanks, Suzanne. Everybody good? Everybody feeling it? Feeling the... <laughs> All right, then that might be it for this time. Until we get to the flower bank repository world next time, uh, that might have to do it. Um, oh, by the way, I didn't... Okay, this has been my Inconceivable Realm presentation. And everybody on all my presentations, I always get so many emails, which is like, do you have any recommended readings? This is really great. This is the book. My, this whole presentation and the last presentation are just PowerPoints of this book. So I have, um, it's an amazing book because they've culled all of the information from all of the original sources. So I couldn't recommend it more. It is, it's not a, it's not this big. It's not the Avatamsaka Sutra. It's very readable, very accessible. Couldn't recommend it more. So with that note of citing my sources, I'm gonna call it a night. Let's share it.